Thanks, buddy. All right. Hi. Hi. Nine minutes, no slides. Good so far? All right. So in June of 2005, I was a brand new platoon leader and helicopter pilot in a new unit. Let's call it Bravo Company. And Bravo Company specialized in putting special operations forces into their missions and back out again. Oftentimes in, under cover of darkness, always at low level. And I was brand new. So to help me learn the ropes, a guy by the name of Stephen Reich helped me learn the organization, helped me meet and learn my platoon. It's about 30 men, pilots and crew chiefs in a platoon. Stephen was a rock star. He's the kind of guy that, if you recall the best athlete in your high school and the valedictorian and the, the person just, that just wanted to serve in the Army after graduation, all rolled into one, that was Stephen Reich. When I say good athlete, he pitched for the Baltimore Orioles after graduating top of his class at West Point, and he decided to turn that down and serve in Bravo Company as its, as its commander. So I'm brand new to this unit, and in 2005, I get one of my first missions, and the mission is to fly four U.S. Navy SEALs behind enemy lines, drop them off, and wait up relatively safe distance away for them to conduct their surveillance and then radio call to us to, to get them back out again. Well, the radio call, pretty easy first day on the job, right? No problem. The radio call that we got was not what we expected. The four SEALs had been ambushed by an enemy force. They were discovered, and they were fighting for their lives. They needed to get out. Now. So I gathered up my platoon, we ran to the helicopters, we turned on the engines, and started to do our checks for a rescue mission when Stephen walked on board the aircraft. He walked up to me, and I thought he was going to tell me what he normally tells me or asks me in, in any one of these situations where he says, Matt, tell me about your plan, walk me through your logic, and I would, and I did. And at the end of it, he said, Great, I think that's a solid plan. And I like everything except the, part, the parts that involve you. Now get off. So to put that in perspective, that's a little bit like Tom Brady of the New England Patriots about to snap the ball on a fourth down, and right before he does, Coach Belichick calling timeout, running out to Brady and saying, look, I know you were about to run the play. I got it. I'll take this one. You run on over to the sidelines, take a knee, it'll be fine. I was devastated. I was crushed. This was my first real opportunity to demonstrate to my platoon what I, that I had what it took. And he had taken that from me. If you've ever seen the movie Lone Survivor or maybe read the book, you might know what happens next. Stephen, along with most of my platoon, Eight SEALs on board that aircraft attempted that rescue mission. And in the process, they were shot down by an RPG, and everyone on board was killed. Not only that, the three, three out of the four SEALs on the ground also lost their lives. One man, Marcus Luttrell, is the only one to survive that mission. I was new to the unit, but I was second in command. And what happens in those situations is you immediately take command. And so now, not only was I new to the unit, but I was charged with taking a few dozen men that I barely knew into this valley of death, they called it, the Korongal Valley, to follow where 19 of their brothers had just fallen. Fast forward to a few years ago. <clears throat> I'm transitioning out of the Army. I've had what I consider to be a somewhat successful career. And I start looking for where I'm going to focus for the second chapter of my professional life. I focused on technology companies. And in my first big interview, 
with a tech company you would all know. Just Google it. And, um, well, you don't have to Google it. It'll just come right up. And, <laughs> and I'm sitting in the interview, and the, and the woman asks me this question. Tell me about a time in the Army where you faced adversity and challenge. I had to think about it, <laughs> but I started to answer. This is going to be great. I'm already going to knock this one out of the park. Let's go. And I start into my story. The only problem is an eighth of the way through, I lose my composure. Has anyone been in an interview where you just, you just bombed it? I mean, I mean it, it stops halfway through bombed it. This is this kind of an interview. And I remember as I was choking up, the interviewer stopped typing and looked up at me in half interest and half horror. <laughs> and I couldn't continue. I didn't get the job. I said, no problem, I've got five more interviews coming up. Next interview, same question, slightly different, same question. I answered the same way, bombed the interview. And this strange thing started to happen. The more I got this question about anything having to do with my Army career, the more this one singular event started to crowd out every other experience that I had, that I had gone through. I didn't understand what was happening. In her book on death and dying, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross explains the five stages of grief, grief, denial, to anger, once you've accepted that something's happened, the anger of why it happened, depression, and sort of a negotiation with a higher power for reversing the loss you've experienced, and finally acceptance. And what I realized was that I was going through the grieving process in real time. I had been in the, in the denial stage for 10 years. And now I was angry. Why did it happen? I was so angry that I couldn't answer that question. Why did Stephen take my place? Why would 19 men lose their lives for seemingly no reason at all? And I spiraled into depression. I spiraled into a dark chapter in my life to substance abuse. I turned my back on my family, on my God. And I didn't know who to turn to next. Luckily, some friends and family intervened. They picked me up and said, Matt, you're going to lose your family if you don't snap out of this. And so there are two things that brought me through this darkness. One was an undying faith in Jesus Christ. And two, and I don't have time to go into that part now, so two is an interesting story about Greek mythology. So there's a story about a man named Sisyphus. He lived about 800 years before Christ. Homer wrote about him in Odyssey in his book, The Odyssey. And Sisyphus was a man that rolled this boulder up a hill, and it was a massive, massive boulder. And when he got to the top, just before it cresting the top of the mountain, it would roll all the way back down again to the bottom of the hill. And I, I listened to my friend tell me this story. I said, are you comparing me to Sisyphus? That's awful. What an awful existence. It, I would roll the boulder up twice, and the second time it rolled down, I would say, that's it. I've had enough. What a futile effort. How is this helping me answer the question why? And his answer was very interesting. It was this. The myth of, Sis of Sisyphus is that he doesn't feel that futility. He doesn't experience that anguish of having to do it over and over again. He wasn't being forced to do it. If he was, if he, if he was forced to do it, he would do that. There was, no, there was no tiger on a chain that was ready to let loose and come after him. So... He had to make a choice. And in that very moment, when the boulder falls down to the bottom of the mountain, it's the most human that that man is. And he has a decision. Do I go down and pick that up again? Or do I curse my fate and ask why over and over and over again? And my friend told me this. Sisyphus understands what you don't understand. And that is sometimes you don't know why. And you'll never know why. But in that struggle... And in that pain and that toil is nobility, is dignity, is growth. And so he chooses to go to the bottom of that mountain, pick up that boulder, and push it up the mountain over and over and over because that's the source of his strength, his joy, 
and his happiness. And he said, if you really want to come through this tunnel of darkness, you've got to understand you will never know why that happened, but so many great things came out of it. So just a very short thing that I learned about Stephen Reich and why I think he did what he did. Stephen taught me that real leaders never ask their teams to do things they wouldn't be willing to do themselves. This is true in business, but even more so in war. And I'm reading this because this is how I wrote it the very first time to grapple with this question. Leaders eat last, meaning if you're going to run out of food and some of your troops will go hungry, you should be among the hungry. Stephen knew in his heart this would be one of the riskiest, most dangerous missions we'd flown in a long time. If he was going to ask his men to fly into the teeth of the enemy, he would be right there alongside them. He believed with every fiber of his being that he owed that much to Marcus Luttrell, the three other SEALs, and the total 19 men that day, men he was asking to risk everything to save those in need. But more importantly, he taught me that these beliefs are so deeply held in him that he lived by them and was willing to die for them. So his final lesson was not to waste time living your life by principles and values you don't really believe in. Stephen's final lesson urged all of us to find those beliefs that drive you, that wake you up in the middle of the night crying, that you'd be willing to go to the ends of the earth for. For those things you believe in so strongly, you give up absolutely everything to see them through. So my core message today is this. Find those values in hardship and in crucible and in your crucible. And if you know a veteran going through a tough time, they're going to go through those grieving stages sometime or another. If you know them, help them through that. And don't let it come out at the worst possible time. Thank you.